Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I remember that lab very well. It took me an hour studying and it. it was a great place for me to get, get away from the lab when I needed to study somewhere besides there. Um, so, uh, Michael Platt and I go back for many years. It's great to hang out with him again. He came to Bloomington a couple weeks ago, um, which was also really great. But the, um, let's just start off here with a trapeze video. So, I do this every day. We just put our rig away for the winter season. I'm the catcher, so I'm the one who hangs upside down and is stupid enough to do it day after day. Wow. I am someone who does a lot of concussion research, and that includes studying myself. So here's the perpetrator, my friend Steve. Here's me. He used to hit me on the upper lip. Here's my friend Cindy. He's also a perpetrator. I take a lot of punishment. Steve's going to come in. He's going to be a little low on a double somersault. I thought the trick was okay, so I kind of came right in for the catch. Not that I really can get out of the way. Oh! And you can see that I took the back of his skull, his occipital lobe, gave me a good smack right on my maxillary bone. Luckily, I was wearing a mouth guard, my teeth oh, survived. Oh. Um, this was pretty much a classic concussion for me. Um, I've gotten these periodically for the last 30 plus years of my life. So, and there we go, one last view of the same injury. Um, this is a couple years ago. We'll get to watch some few more videos and we'll see. There's the aftermath. Um, and we'll stop there. So, uh, I wear a lot of different hats at Indiana University. I wear a lot of clinical hats. I wear a lot of basic science hats. I have the privilege of working on the sidelines of IU Athletics. Here's a bunch of different pictures. For Michael Platt, here's our friend Mickey Goldberg, who just came to visit me two weeks ago. So there's Mickey and I on the sidelines. Everything that I do, most of my research involves IU Athletics. I'm going to actually present some non-IU athlete work here to begin with and then switch over to that. I want to thank all of my wonderful colleague, clinical colleagues for everything that I get to do. Now, Michael asked me to both talk about peak performance and to talk about injury. So I'm going to tie a couple different topics together and try to do both and try to do it both in a half hour. I'm first going to talk about can we assist the brain in returning to peak performance after a concussion. So I'm going to present some research from our civilian concussion clinic, our non-athlete concussion clinic. And then I'm going to turn over to a basic science story that I did on visual neuroscience, not concussion per, per se, where we asked the question, can we achieve better peak performance through vision training with our IU baseball batters? Let me thank my clinical colleagues. The first thing I'm going to talk about is our vision concussion clinic. So Don Lyon and Katie Conley are two of my clinical colleagues. Uh, these are several PhD students, Gabriel, Lauren, and Katie. Uh, Terry Horner is a team neurosurgeon and a friend of mine for many, many years. Just happens to be that Tina Master was visiting us when I took this picture off of our deck. Tina is here at CHOP. She is one of, the, um, one of my close friends and a world expert on pediatric concussions. Um, and Tina and I go back um, for many, many years. So we run a concussion vision clinic at the IU School of Optometry. It is not open to the public. We entirely, this is entirely a tertiary care center. What that means is we don't advertise it, it is not on our website. You have to be referred to us by a primary care physician, by a neurologist, by a pediatrician. You are having persisting, over three months of persisting vision problems when you are referred to this clinic. We've been running it for a number of years and when anybody who sees us is enrolled in our um, studies at the same time, so I can present some data about this. Now, this may be hard to read, and I apologize for that, but I'll just walk you through it anyway. These are the chief complaints of the first 408 patients who came to our clinic over the first couple of years. And I just want to highlight that, of course, headache, everybody's going to have a vision problem, because this is a vision clinic, tertiary care. 50% had headache. That's not too surprising. If you know anything about concussions and mild traumatic brain injury, and this is both, where you have a lot of adults, a lot of car accident type patients who are here. But we also have a bunch of things that will fall into the category of binocular vision. We have diplopia, double vision, 32%, blur, 36%, focusing, eye strain, reading. The second most common deficit after headache in our binocular, in our vision tertiary care clinic has to do with the binocular vision system. That's your ability to go from looking at distance to looking at something near and bringing the two eyes together to converge and focusing the eye on the inside of the lens inside your eye, the interocular lens. When we turn around and look at the diagnosis codes for our patients, same group of people, nice thing that we were also a little surprised, we have a group over here on the right, presbyopia, that's reading glasses, hyperopia, myopia. We have a population of almost a third of our patients who actually don't have a problem with binocular vision problems. Their concussion has made them realize that they need reading glasses, that they need regular distance glasses, 
and all we have to do is give them an optical correction and they are good to go. However, the rest of our patients are often sh showing binocular vision deficits, and I'm going to particularly focus on this group here. A third of them have convergence insufficiency. So let me define that for you a little bit more. Convergence insufficiency is when you're trying to view something at a distance. Um, you're trying to look at something that's near, and you don't get there. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm trying to look at my computer, and I converge my eyes, but I do not converge them onto this depth plane. Instead, I miss it, and I'm looking another foot, say, or two feet beyond that depth plane. That's what convergence insufficiency is. You're simply not capable of getting your eyes converged to the correct depth plane, producing blur, producing eye strain, producing all of the issues that we were talking about. Um, so now the question is, what can we do for these patients? Well, there is a treatment. It's been developed for many, many years, and that is for convergence insufficiency and vision therapy. Now, um, Convergence insufficiency, besides concussions, is common in children, so most of these studies are focused on children. And vision therapy is kind of analogous to physical therapy. The idea is that you've created some maladaptive bad habits, just as you do after orthopedic injuries. And this visual training, similar to physical therapy, will help you get over that maladaptation and get back on track, in the case of children, to developing a proper binocular visual system in order to be able to read comfortably. And so you have a trained therapist that walks you through a whole bunch of manual, hands-on, one-on-one training to um, try to get these children, in this case, to um, get their binocular visual system where it should be. Now, um, you're going to, as I said, you're going to need multiple versions of me, um, I, all my different hobbies and all of our different habits. Um, as was alluded to, one of my other happy hobbies habits and hobbies is being a ski patroller. I love skiing. I love being a ski patroller. I love emergency medicine. I'm a, a licensed ski guide. I'm also a first responder and do county search and rescue. All those things are very fun. But there's another me that you also need to meet. And this is the NYU me. This is a scientific curmudgeon. And anybody who's known me for very long knows that I'm probably the world's worst scientific curmudgeon, or at least I'm in the running and I'll battle it out for anybody. I have a grumpy, bad attitude about everything when it comes to science. So what does the scientific curmudgeon me think about vision therapy? Well, thankfully, there's a nice, large registered clinical trial. We had a nice clinical trial presented to us earlier um, this afternoon. I was very excited. I thought it was well-designed. Many things about this large clinical trial was also done correctly. It was led by Mitch Simon, who's here in the Philadelphia area at Solace, um, Solace Optometry School, very large multi-center study, very large budget, 15 sites. They did a lot of things right about the study, and I'm going to highlight those on the next slide. Let me just show you that their conclusions are that office-based visual accommodative therapy, that's what this acronym is, so come into the office and work hands-on with a therapist, that this 12 weeks of this in-office vision therapy improved overall symptoms and they, their clinical guidance practice is that this will be, is an effective treatment for convergence insufficiency. So maybe this would be a good therapy for all of our patients in our concussion therapy, in our concussion vision clinic. As I said, they did a bunch of things right, so let's make sure we highlight the good things from the CITT, Convergence Insufficiency Treatment Trial Group. Just like the study before, it was a randomized study. It was semi-double blind. Everybody in the study was blinded. The patients, the staff, the only people who weren't blinded were the actual therapists, of course, they can't be because they're doing the therapy that they're told to do. But they were detached from everything else, so it was good. They made a serious effort to create a behavioral placebo control group. Let me just emphasize that that is tough. It's easy to do placebo controls when you can just hand out a sugar pill. It's not easy to generate a placebo control when it's behavioral intervention. They put a good effort in and they did a pretty good job, and I'm going to tell you about that in part two of my talk, because we're going to borrow their placebo control for our baseball study. They made a serious effort also in developing a home-based therapy that did not require coming into an office and spending a lot of money and a lot of resources. Maybe you can just send your patient home with a toolkit that they can do at home quite cost-effective. They tried to develop one of those as well. They're, and it's pretty good, 226 children for a study that's this labor intense. That's a, not a bad end, in my opinion. But there are two serious issues with this study. First is that the primary outcome measure 
was a convergence insufficiency <laughs> symptom survey, the CISS. Honestly, you should never do a clinical trial, if you can even remotely can, you should never do a clinical trial that uses symptom surveys. Symptom surveys are just notoriously bad. They have terrible test retest reliability. Ask people if they have a headache today and ask them whether they have one tomorrow and a month from now and a year from now, you'll get wildly different results. They, um, so it's just never a good idea. And it's turned out since they did this study that this symptom survey was in fact unreliable and it does not do a good job of diagnosing those with convergence insufficient and those with that. So that is a real kiss of death to this study. The other problem that, with this study is that although they had a placebo control group, they did not do a good job of managing the number of hours that the placebo group came into the clinic to do the in-office placebo. In fact, it was half. <laughs> so one half of your group that did the office-based therapy came in for, say, 30, 40 hours of vision training. The placebo group only came in for 20. And so you have a real problem of a dose-response effect there in the placebo group. So this means that, what does this man think? What do I think about the CITT? And I can only come to one conclusion. I'm calling it the way I see it. I'm going with 100% pure bovine estimate. And so that means, would I, sorry, I didn't even get this comment quite yet. Would we use, should we use vision therapy for our patients in our concussion clinic? The answer is no. In my opinion, it is not justified. Now, before I go on to part two of my talk, I do want to talk for a moment about the placebo effect. And I thought maybe for a business audience, this would be a good comic. The comic says, our trials show that the new drug performs no better than placebo. And you have the man in the lab coat up here looking at some graphs. And then the rest of the people here at the table say, maybe we should invest in placebos. <laughs> that, there's a lot of good placebo jokes out there. This one, there were over a thousand on comicsoft.com for me to choose from. Um, and the placebo effect is honestly a very important thing to understand. So let's review a few, few key concepts. Patients are given an inert substance or treatment, but the patient believes the treatment will be effective or efficacious. So that's our definition of the placebo and a placebo effect. And this belief here is the most important part. The patient needs to believe that this, behave, that this treatment or this medication, this drug, is going to work. In nearly all clinical studies, the placebo effect will produce a 25% improvement of whatever your outcome measure is. And that could be some of the most strong medications in the world. Things like morphine have a 25% placebo effect if you tell the patient that you're going to give them morphine rather than you just sneaking it into an IV. I mean, it's just, and if, you, if there's not a placebo effect in a clinical trial study, the problem with the study was done wrong because it is always there and it is always a spectacularly large effect. And in fact, most of the time, it's very difficult to find any effect beyond the placebo effect. And as we know, most clinical trials fail. And as I just mentioned a moment ago, I want to also emphasize that the placebo effect can easily have a dose response curve, and that's been shown again and again. Now, another thing in clinical medicine, oh yeah, so there was a good comment for the, for the dose response curve. <laughs> we have a man here, he's like standing in front of the placebos at CVS, and we have placebos, and then we have fast-acting extra strength placebos. The man goes, hmm, better go with these ones on the right, so I have fast-acting extra strength. The dose response curve is always there as well, if you bother to look in a placebo-based study. You can use a placebo effect now ethically as a treatment for your patients. And this is done all the time, but you do have to be careful. So AMA and the other medical groups do highlight that while it's okay to do this, you have to be careful because you do not want to blow the trust of your, the patient, patient's trust in you if you are prescribing a placebo. If they find out that it's a placebo and they thought you were giving them a real medication, you can blow your trust and um, that can be detrimental to the patient. But it is, if you are careful in obtaining consent with a patient, you can actually use placebo as an effective treatment. So then, and I could do an entire hour just on the neuroscience of the placebo effect. We had our nice group just a few minutes ago talking about how the brain and the heart are inter um, very intertwined. I have a full cardiac setup in my re concussion research lab. I have echocardiograms, ECGs, we have a beat-to-beat -beat millisecond blood pressure system. We are actually very involved in cardiac and autonomic, dis autonomic dysfunction in concussion. But what I want to point out here is just, we all kind of intuitively didn't know this. Neuroscientists are busy trying to figure this out nowadays. The placebo effect is real. 
When you believe that something is going to produce a benefit, you can measure that physiologically. The belief system is what where the brain starts, but the brain is in charge of the endocrine system. It is in charge of the pituitary gland. It is in charge of the autonomic nervous system. All of these things are physiological things that you can measure, and you can show nowadays that the placebo effect is real. It's real for your from an epidemiological standpoint, and it is real from a physiological standpoint. So don't ever disrespect the placebo effect. Um, it is actually a very important part of clinical medicine. Another equally important part of clinical medicine is the nocebo effect. But I'll have to say that's relatively poorly, mostly overlooked in clinical medicine today. And to the fact that there's not one comic on the nocebo effect, <laughs> even though there were 1,024 placebo effect comics. So what is a nocebo effect? It's just the inverse. The patient is given an inert substance or treatment, but they believe it will produce a negative effect on them. This belief that it's going to have a negative effect is just as important as the placebo effect where you believe that it's going to have a positive effect. And a very good example of this, these are not comics, these are just explanations of the nocebo effect. Oh, well. A nice example of the nocebo effect was the recent SARS-CoV-2 clinical trials. In this group, for the messenger RNA vaccine groups, there were 38,000 people who received the placebo in the SARS-CoV-2 clinical trials, and another 60,000, of course, who received the actual messenger RNA for the vaccine. And in this group of 38,000 people, of course, social media was everywhere. Everybody was paying attention to the clinical trials. We we're all stuck at home wondering if we we're going to have a vaccine that was going to work and we could go back to life, be a little closer to normal. And I just want you to notice what the adverse reaction events rates were in this placebo group. 28% reported fatigue. 25% reported headache for a placebo group that simply got a saline shot in their anterior deltoid. So adverse reactions in placebo groups are always present in clinical trials as well. The SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is just probably on a scale almost never done before in terms of the number of people. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying the nocebo effect. So let's switch gears here. And now let's talk a little bit about, um, so, well, that's a, let's give a summary first. Concussions produce a variety of clinical deficits, which include problems in the visual system, and this is both concussions and mild traumatic brain injury. Convergence insufficiency is a common result from a concussion and, a mild, and or a mild TBI. The clinical trials from the convergence insufficiency treatment trial um, are inadequate because of their reliance on a poor outcome measure of self-reported symptoms and the fact that I believe that they were seeing simply a dose-response placebo effect in their placebo control group. And so I cannot recommend this therapy to anybody. The placebo and no placebo effects are always major players in healthcare, and clinical trials must carefully implement this, and clinicians must ethically use it when they choose to do so. Okay, let's take a break. Time for more techies. <laughs> now we're going to fast forward to this uh, most recent summer. Uh, of course, I'm going to be in the catcher swing as always. Here's my friend Cortland, and she's going to come in and also do a double somersault, and we'll see how I do. So here we go. I say this from last, last fall. Same trick. Going to come in. Going to be a little low. Oh, God. Going to have the same general problem, except for I seem to have learned from my mistakes. You're going to see here that I start to drop away just as the back of her head decides to give my sternum a kiss. So I'm starting to drop. I start falling away the other way. <laughs> and I escape another serious injury. We just <laughs> leave and blow is all that happened there. I intentionally called the trick of which you're late, so I will be dropping away because I was pretty convinced we weren't quite ready to catch that trick that day. But we'll get to this. We'll get another update about Portland and I here coming up in another minute. We'll see how, <laughs> see how things work out. Okay. Now let's move on to part two and talk about peak performance in athletes. Um, and we won't talk about concussions for a few minutes. And we're going to ask the question, can we assist athletes to achieve better peak performance through vision training? The same thing where I'm saying it's not working in terms of convergence insufficiency. Let's see if we can um, improve batting performance in our IU baseball players. This study was absolutely done with a collaboration with this gentleman, Greg Appelbaum. I would not have done this study without him. He cold called me one day in my office 
said, hey, we have a lot in common. Just like it turns out we have a lot in common. It turned out Greg and I did. Greg's like, I can see that you have access to the complete IU athletic department. I'm like, yeah, I do. I have a lab. I have an office. I'm in the stadium every day. And Greg's like, I want to see if we can make baseball. I want to see if vision training can make baseball batters better. And I'm like, you guys are talking to? He's like, no, not really. <laughs> okay. I'm a reverse scientific curmudgeon. So Greg and I make a good yin yang um, collaboration because he's probably the most positive guy I know. And I'm just constantly, like, every meeting, like, this is bullshit. This is all terrible. None of this is going to work. <laughs> um, and so it's been a fun collaboration with Greg. But I told Greg from the very beginning, you have to promise me two things. We have to fix the things that were wrong in the CIPP after I told them all about it. I said the placebo group and the intervention group have to receive the same number of hours of training and identical belief system. And Greg's like, no problem. I'm putting you in charge. You design the placebo control group. And I promise that Duke will do the same number of hours. And of course, I was going to be in charge of the IU data. And then I told Doug. Sorry, Greg, I was like, we have to get the outcome measures correct, and they have to be objective and reproducible. And this is when Greg educated me on something that I knew nothing about because I'd never spent much time in the um, baseball facility besides watching a couple games. It turns out that baseball has awesome computational tools for batting, and I was unaware of this until we started this study. The product that we use, which is probably the biggest player in the marketplace, is TrackMan. This is a high-speed camera, LiDAR, radio, radar system using both video and radar. It gives you true physics kinematics. You get the kinematics of every pitch and every hit. You get exit velocity, launch angle, and distance. Just as that implies, exit velocity would be the speed of the ball as it exits the bat. Launch angle is going to be the angle of elevation, and there's a sweet spot, so coaches want you to, um, and are going to coach you to hit the sweet spot of 25 to 35 degrees of elevation. And of course, the other goal is distance, uh, which is pretty obvious. So what's nice about this TrackMan setup, when Greg and I first started playing the study, is it was like, ah, now that's an outcome measure. Straight up hard physics, hard data, Nothing wishy-washy, nothing about symptoms, nothing about something really noisy like counting strikes and balls or anything like that. This was physics. And I was like, okay, Greg, I'm in. We can keep going. So we did the study. I'm going to give you the details. This has been published about a year and a half ago, 2020, so two years ago now, almost for some three. Um, let me make sure I give everybody due credit. My friends Don and Katie, who helped me with the concussion vision clinic, are on this paper. Uh, Siong was first author. He ran the study at Duke. Lindsay is the co-first author. She ran the study for me at IU. Greg and I share in the um, senior author position. Here's a picture of Lindsay. Let me just thank her for doing it. Lindsay is an Air Force optometrist. She was incognito in civilian clothes for three or four years with me doing her PhD, Air Force sponsored PhD. She's gone back to the Air Force now. What did we do? Well. We're going to have season statistics from the players from the previous year, so that's kind of a given. Of course, not every player is going to be playing with us this year because players graduate, players transfer. We are going to do pre-training evaluations with a tool that's a visual tool from a company called Synaptic. It's honestly a piece of crap. It's <laughs> not clinically useful. I can say that with authority because that is my job. I'm one of my, I am a professor of school of optometry. <laughs> It is also not useful from a sports standpoint. The data is, I'm not going to present it because there was nothing interesting in it. But we did do the pre-training visual evaluations with the Synaptic tool. It just wasn't useful. Then what we did at IU, where I had control over the study, was we did three days of researcher control, meaning I controlled the batting practice. We paid. Baseball players loved it. You mean you're going to pay me $80 to come and do a half an hour of batting practice, which I was going to do anyway? I'm like, yep. They're like, yeah, I'll be there. I'll see you in 10 minutes. You know? And they were like, that was the easiest sell in the world. So we're going to have every player do three days of several hundred um, hits. I paid for the um, pitcher. I controlled it. I wasn't using coaching time, so the coaches were happy. And then we're going to do 10 weeks of vision training, which I'm going to explain to you in just a minute. And then we did another three days of batting practice on some cold December afternoons, so I thought that it was just sunny enough and warm enough to do this. Unfortunately, the kiss of death for our study is going to be what happened at Duke. Greg didn't have that kind of control. He said, I quote, outsource the Duke batting practice to the Duke coaches. You're going to see that that yielded a very small amount of data. 
So the Duke data is actually very problematic, and that's going to cause a problem for my interpretation of the whole study. Then we did post-training evaluations, also not interesting. See the statistics. Um, we're done, and unfortunately, there was no effect there. So here's this actual study. Of course, we had 40 players. Half of them are pitchers, so now we're down to 20 players. Some didn't want to do it. 20, uh, 20 batters, because the other half were pitchers. So at each school, we wound up with the 12 people who were willing to go through the complete study. It was a lot of time, because they had to do vision therapy in my lab, in the stadium, four times a week for 10 weeks. Okay, we were paying them for it, but it was still a huge commitment of time, so some players bailed. So we're going to wind up with 12, 24 players total, Duke and IU, 12 at IU, 12 at Duke. They're going to get randomized into two groups, dynamic vision training and placebo vision training. I'm going to tell you what that training is right now. The dynamic vision training, the way we pitch this to the baseball players is we're going to have you do fancy new digital tools versus old school optometry school tools. And they basically bought it. So when we did the exit surveys, they didn't know that they were in a placebo group. Of course, they weren't blinded. They all are on the same team, and they all know each other. There's no way we're keeping them from talking. So it is not a blinded study. But it did apparently work. We did stroboscopic vision training. This is a pair of glasses made by Synaptec, where basically you can control the flicker rate of these fancy sunglasses blocking their vision. And we had them doing all kinds of throwing, catching, and baseball batting drills where we were intentionally reducing their visual capabilities by having them wear these strobes that were blanking their vision. It got really hard when, you, we, when we took them to the most difficult settings. Hard to hit a baseball that moves, we weren't pitching at full speed, but still, even half speed pitching, batting is very difficult when you have your vision being constantly flashed on and off. We used some tools from them that were about, about required tracking an LED on a track with some sort of timing drills, we did some dynamic visual acuity drills on a tablet. So this was the dynamic vision training. We then did a placebo control. We borrowed the CIT key. Basically, you take old school vision training tools from optometry, and you intentionally break them. So here's a classic example of the Brock string. You're basically asking, the, in this case, a baseball player to look at different depth planes, which are these balls on the string. We would break that by, have, by passing an eye, so they are not actually converging their eyes. They're actually just making psychotic eye movements to the different balls. Every one of our placebo things was borrowed from the CITT. As I said, I do think they did a design that vision training regimen that was pretty good. Because these are not kids but adults and we needed to keep them engaged because they're athletes and they love to compete, we mixed in a bunch of monocular eye-hand games that just kept them engaged and entertaining. We literally had them playing surgery. Um, Operation. Uh, operation and Jenga and things like that. We were patching an eye, so they were doing a monocular. The primary reason to do this is that they just cannot compete with each other. They just absolutely is perfect in their brain so deep. And so we just kept, by having them compete to see who got the highest score, it just kept them engaged throughout all the vision training. Okay, so what did we actually find? And then I'll be done. I do data. Pretty proud of it for what we have. As I said, we only have six people in the group. That's a huge problem. But we did have lots of data, so we had 3, almost 3,000 pitches during those batting practices that I controlled. We have exit velocity, launch angle, and hit distance. Placebo group is the lighter color gray. The digital visual training group is the darker gray. You can see that exit velocity doesn't differ, differ between the two groups. But you can see that we had a greater improvement over 10 weeks of vision training. And let me point out that during these 10 weeks of vision training, they're going to baseball practice every day. So they are going to get better at batting as they go through baseball practice, and they did. But you can see that for this very small group of people, six specifically, we had a greater improvement in the dynamic visual training group over the placebo visual training groups. Both groups got better. One group got a little bit better, and that happened to be the digital training group, not the placebo control. Our effect size, actually, in the world of sports is pretty good. So we have an effect size difference between these two groups of 0.71. That's not shabby, considering um, considering the sports. However, the Duke data is basically rubbish. Greg knows that. I can't tell you how many times we got into a huge fight, and I said to him, I have I can just not put my name on this paper. You can have the data do whatever the hell you want with it. Um, that, so I got talked off the cliff many times. You see my name's on the paper. <laughs> but they had a ter they just don't have enough data. 327 pitches. They also have 12 players randomized into two groups. The data is just total rubbish. It's all over the place. If anything, it got worse, but none of it's significant. So 
this study has some good things and it has some bad things. We did eventually compromise on our conclusion. This is a control and pre-registered study, that's true. Preliminary evidence that visual training may improve batting performance, but we need the warrants for the study. That's as far as I could go. There are some good things about this study. We did it randomized, we registered it like a clinical trial. We made a serious effort to create a placebo control group borrowing the CITT's ideas because they did a good job with it. Bad parts about our study, the number of outcome trials at one site is unacceptable. That basically rules out the Duke data as being usable. The number of subjects is too low by at least a factor of three. So if I do a power analysis, that's what we do in statistics to try to figure out how many subjects you should have. What we would discover is that we are way, way underpowered. So final conclusion, what does this guy think of this guy? Uh, well, it's very simple. I'm calling 100% pure bovine excrement on my own data. No two ways about it. This is an intriguing result. It was worth publishing. It's worth repeating. I think we can improve it, but we need to add a whole lot of sites if we're going to actually be able to say anything that's even remotely authoritative that this type of visual training improves baseball performance. It might, perhaps, but I'm definitely not convinced. All right, so final thing. One more trick. Let's see how we do. Now, this is be different tricks. This is be Cortland again. But Cortland's going to do a what's called over the bar front. So she's going to be on top of the bar. She's going to launch off of it, do a full front flip, and then hopefully get caught by me. This one has good sound, but I hope it's almost worth right here. There she goes. Looking high enough, looking good. She puts herself on top of the bar. Front flip. But she's not going to go high enough. Oh. And Courtney gives herself a rose protection. So, uh, made a catch. That's good. You're going to hear her say something here in just a second. So she just said, I just whacked the crap out of my brain. So uh, <laughs> she wouldn't admit that she had a concussion, but I didn't let her fly for a week either way because I was not convinced. So, all right, with that, I should really stop. Uh, my conclusions are that vision training for um, visual training for clinical conditions does not yet have a definitive evidence to support its use, including for our concussion clinic. Placebo and nocebo effects are major influences in all clinical studies. And vision training for sports might work, but at the moment, I would say it's not even remotely ready for prime time. We need to do more research. All right, thanks a lot.